We are picking up where my colleagues have left off, Romans chapter 12. We will be reading from verses 9 to 13. I'm going to ask you to do a favor for me as you read. I have to engage your mind here. I want you to count, keep track of how many commands are in these verses. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 13. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. How many did you come up with? Uh, by my list, I got 13. So I'm going to retitle this sermon to 13 things every Christian must do all the time. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have 13 points. So this is not a Baptist sermon. It's not even a good Calvinist sermon with five points. It's a sermon for bakers, and so we've got 13 points. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We'll actually do six points, summarizing some of these. And uh, six points is actually Calvinism, you know that. The, the sixth point of Calvinism is everyone should be one. <laughs> but enough on that. Uh, the first is the simple word love. That's the first, love. Uh, the love that Paul says of ours uh, is to be sincere, uh, without hypocrisy, authentic. It's a key word today. Uh, th those of you that work with youth know that youth want authenticity. It's not a bad thing to require or ask for. And it's what Paul says of this love. And then we'll, we'll skip over 9b for the moment and drop down to 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. We know that word, Philadelphia. I, I lived outside of Philadelphia for many years. A little bit of irony that the city of Philadelphia means brotherly love, but we will leave that for the time being. But it's, it's a love that is not a romantic love. It's a love that is a kindness for one another. A love that cares for one another. I was, I was looking in Dr. Sproul's commentary on Romans, and he said this on this verse. The tombstone of an honorable person might read, he was a kind person. And then R.C. adds, the deceased might have been unsuccessful by worldly standards, but a kind person is successful in the eyes of God. Now, the reason why I found that very interesting is on his tombstone, it says, he was a kind man. And then it says, redeemed by a kinder Savior. Uh, we know that we love because we have first been loved. Uh, we know that this command, and in fact, all of these commands that follow are, are not like the, the ethical principles. As, as Paul's giving these principles here, they're no different than the style of the Greek philosophers who precede him and the Roman philosophers who were his contemporary and the great ethicists who come after him, people like Marcus Aurelius with their pithy aphorisms of telling us what is the secret to life and, and how we can live. It's very similar, uh, Paul's ethics here, just rattling off these commands. But right out of the gate, we should recognize that these 
ethical commands are so different. The, the whole system is so different from that of the Greco-Roman philosophers and all of their pursuit of justice and the good life. You know, ethics is concerned with behavior and behaviors, uh, right or wrong. And so we see good behaviors here that are, uh, we are exhorted to demonstrate, and we see behaviors that we are to avoid. But ethics is also much more fundamental than that. Uh, the, the actual word ethics is a Greek word. The Latin word is habitus, from which we get the, the word habits. It's our dispositions. It's ethics, in the end, is who we are. Uh, you don't have to really do much hard work to cultivate a bad habits. If you want to cultivate the habit of sleeping in, for instance, it's a relatively easy habit to cultivate. Uh, if, if you want to, to grow weeds in your garden, it's a relatively easy thing to do. Uh, but if you want to cultivate flowers or a vegetable garden, what do you have to do? You have to work. And, and bad habits are like weeds in our life, and you really don't have to do anything to cultivate them. Our natural inclination does all of the work for us. But to cultivate good habits. And so ethics is, is about behaviors, but it's also about the, the disposition. It's about who we are. And in the Greek, Greco-Roman world, ethics was about something even more fundamental. The, the philosophers would debate not only what was the good or what was right versus what was wrong, but they would debate between what is the good and what is the best. And they'd call it the summum bonum, what is the highest good. And so, in these verses, and with this first command, Paul hops right in there, doesn't he? These are behaviors, but this is who we are. And if we want to know what the highest good, it's all right here for us. Uh, we could go back and go back with me to John chapter 14. I'm sorry, John chapter 13. And you know these verses. Verses 34 and 35. A new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you. And I, I think that's both standard and impetus. It's both the standard and it's also what enables us to do it. Even, we might say, propels us to do it. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So in this section, back to Romans 12, as Paul steps in here to give us these 13 behaviors that we must do, of course he's going to start with love. Because he's going to remind us that this is the highest good. And he's going to remind us that we can love because we have been loved. And if we think there's anybody out there that is perhaps too unlovely to be loved, maybe we will just remember ourselves. Well, the first is love. To love with that brotherly affection. As, as Dr. Sproul says, this is, this is played out in kindness. And I do think we have to add two things to that. Uh, one is, we all know this, but let's remember this. Kindness is not niceness. Those are two different things. 
the kindest thing we can do for people is tell them the truth. Uh, you, you know what the difference here is? It's, um, it, it, let's say you're a music teacher and your, your student has worked so hard on a piece and they perform that piece for you and it's just not quite up to the standard and you have them right in front of you and you say, I, I didn't know that singing that piece like that was even possible. <laughs> You're just being nice. <laughs> Kindness is not niceness. But I want to add quickly Kindness is a very underrated virtue, especially in a world that is so angry. People are just so angry. And don't discount or discredit what simple kindness can do and how disarming it could be. Well, the first is love. Uh, the second command here, I'm going to give you this word, emulate. Emulate. Uh, when you emulate, you have, you have uh, someone that's superior. Say you're an athlete or a musician. You have that person who has accomplished, and you don't want to just simply you know, copy or imitate. You want to emulate. Well, if you look at verse 9b, I think we are commanded here to emulate, and we are commanded here to emulate God. And we emulate God when we hate what he hates and we love what he loves. They're two sides of the same coin. And so Paul says, abhor. Uh, from the inner core of your being, detest. To keep it arm's length. To call it for what it is. Abhor what is evil. But then, with all that same intensity and white-knuckling might, Hold fast to that which is good. And the first century was a world where evil was called good and good was called evil. And so is the 21st century. A world where evil is called good. And good is seen as evil. But we're called to pattern our lives after something entirely different aren't we, than the pattern of this world. Isn't that where we began in chapter 12? And so we must emulate the mind of God. We must think God's thoughts after him. Which means, what is the mark of a Christian? Well, Christian is one who hates evil. And a Christian is one who knows the treasured value of uh, that which is good. So we have love. We have emulate. For the third one, I want to use the word defer. You see it there in the second half of verse 10. Outdo one another in showing honor. Now, I think Paul could have made things a, a little bit simplified if he simply said, be humble. Uh, but he worked it out this way. Uh, trip over yourself. Trip over yourself and putting up the other person. Uh, trip over yourself and setting aside your prerogatives, your rights, your entitlements so that the other person could have the clear path. Deferential is the disposition. Uh, we might even say the church should be an honorific culture. Uh, probably uh, no culture uh, represents that more than the military culture of showing honor and showing deference. Or, I've always been impressed by the German university system because there you're not simply doctor 
or professor. But in the German university system, you're Herr Professor Doctor. It's an it's a honorific system. But what would it look like? Uh, what would it look like if we did not always insist on our entitlements, but if we, we, we just sort of stepped aside a moment and said, let me honor you. Why don't you step in here? Now, surely, and we just heard, and Paul would affirm that there are gifts and there are offices, and those gifts and those offices must function or the church won't function smoothly. So it doesn't mean a, a deference to where uh, now there's no offices in the church or there's no structure in the church or there's no leadership in the church, no hierarchical organizational structures. It doesn't mean that. But it means a disposition of recognizing that the other person is in the image of God and being transformed into the image of Christ and is due honor. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter tells us uh, where he says we are to give an answer for the hope that is in us, that great apologetics passage. You know what he says? But do it with gentleness and reverence is how the ESV translates it. Now, if you were to go trace that back up to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you'd see that we are commanded to fear God. And it's the same word. The word translated down in 3.16 is the word phobon, phobia, fear. So now let's think this through. The, the attitude Peter is saying that we should have towards God should be the attitude we have towards the non-Christian. And, and even in the context, maybe someone who's persecuting you. That's what it means when Paul says, outdo one another in showing honor. Treat human beings with reverence. So we are to love, we are to emulate, we are to defer. Fourthly, we are to serve. One of my favorite Romans commentaries, I think it's stand out, next to Dr. Sproul's, of course, is the Romans commentary by John Murray classic text. Now, Murray says this about, about uh, this verse, about verse 11. When discouragement overtakes the Christian and fainting of spirit is the sequel, it is because the claims of the Lord's service have ceased to be uppermost in our thought. He's saying we forget. We forget that we're servants called to serve the living God. And when we forget that, it's really easy to get discouraged and disappointed and maybe even disillusioned. And it's easy to not be, as Paul says, fervent in spirit. Whether in verses 9 to 13, many of these other ethical injunctions are singular, but when we get to verse 11, the first two, the three phrases there, the first two are really setting us up for how we should serve, or there's three different things in verse 11. Whether there are three different things there or those first two are setting us up for how we should serve, as you look at what is required of us there, it is to be diligent, 
to persevere, to stay at it, to have the game day approach every day. Do not be slothful in zeal. Not just don't be slothful, but zealous. And be fervent in spirit. I mean, this is, this is Paul calling us to it. Because here's what you have to do. Are you ready? You have to serve. You have to serve. There's not a lot of accolades for a servant. As I mentioned, it's disappointing. Sometimes even flat out disillusioning. This great story from church history of the martyrdom of Polycarp, old man, bishop in the church, tracked down by a contingent of Roman soldiers, found in uh, a barn on a farmyard, hauled into the arena. He's uh, given the opportunity to deny his faith, and he will be allowed to be set free and live out his, his final years in, in peace. There's a little bit of irony in this text or in this moment, rather, in church history. Polycarp is there in in the arena. The Christians are behind him. The crowd is gathered in the amphitheater. And they tell him, distance yourself from the Christians. Say, away with the atheists. Because the Christians were called atheists, irony of ironies, because they denied the gods of the state. And so all Polycarp had to do was turn to his fellow Christians many of whom he served, and say to them, away with you, deny his faith, and he'd be let go. You know what Polycarp does? Now, I'm going to look out and do this to you, but I don't want you to think I think of you all as second century Roman pagans. I don't. (laughs) He turns to the audience, and with a grand sweeping gesture of his hand, he says, away with the atheists. But you can imagine, he's 86 years old, you could imagine in a moment of weakness, he could have let off the gas of his zeal a little bit. He could have tapped the brakes on his fervent spirit a little bit. But after he says away with the atheists, you know what he says? For 86 years I have served. That's the right word. I have served the Lord. And he has never, never let me down. How could I deny my Savior and King? That's it. Uh, Poly, Polycarp didn't forget that he was a servant. He remembered that he was a servant. And he remembered that he was a servant in the service of the king. And when that extraordinary moment barreled down on him, he was not slothful in zeal. He was fervent in spirit. And he stood. In some ways, this is the test, isn't it? Uh, whether it's in those extraordinary moments that Polycarp experienced or whether it's in those ordinary moments and the routine moments. And honestly, isn't it maybe sometimes harder in the ordinary and routine to let off the gas and, and, and pull into the rest stop and take a break? And what do we have to Remember? We're in the service of the king. We're in the service of the king. If we were literally in the service of a king, and it was literally our time on the clock to do our duty, would we be zealous and fervent? Absolutely. I think of the athlete. Think of the Olympic athlete. Think of all they endure. 
because they so value the prize. And they can do almost, almost seemingly impossible feats for a human being to get there. We can do this. We can serve the Lord. We can, we can follow this command. If we remember, we are servants and we are in the service of the king. Well, we are to love, emulate, defer, serve, and then... I know I should say rejoice in verse 12, but I'm going to go to what the joy is grounded in. And so I'm going to say it, hope. Again, Murray said this, the believer must never have his horizon bounded by what is seen and temporal. If these first century Christians had their horizon bounded by what was seen and what was temporal, they would not be a hopeful people. And if they are not a hopeful people, they would not uh, be a joyful people. So what do they need? They need a perspective that explodes the horizon of the visible and the temporal. And that, that horizon that they need is the invisible in the eternal. And now we can have hope. Now we can know that this God who keeps his promises has promised that there will be a judgment day. There will be a vindication. And so we can have hope. And notice how that spills directly into the next one. We can even be patient in tribulation. But without that eternal perspective, without that perspective on that which is invisible, we would buckle under the times of tribulation. We wouldn't have that fortification. We wouldn't have that steel in our spine. Going back to that 1 Peter 3.15 text, I've always been impressed by this. When Peter says uh, this, this classic command for apologetics, always be ready to give an answer, apologia, apologetics, what does he say? Always be ready to give an answer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and that'd be a great, that'd be true. But he uses a word that stands in for the gospel to represent the gospel effect on the people of God. To talk about the gospel. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. It's standing in for the gospel by stressing what is the effect of the gospel on a Christian's life. So much so that it should ooze out of us and we should be known as a people of hope and here's why this is so interesting because back to the horizon of uh, the boundedness of the temporal and the visible you are the people who should be without hope you're marginalized and insignificant and in the Roman world certain occupations were not even open to you as Christians and, and government posts were off limits, and that upward mobility was hindered, and you'd be ostracized by your family. You'd be cast out. How do you have hope? There's no earthly reason whatsoever that you should have hope, but you do. And so we can rejoice And so we can be patient, which is also the idea of endure tribulation. And the ground of it is the hope. And we know this, hope is not a wish dream. It's a reality. When we talk about biblical hope, we are talking about the promises of God. And time and time again, God demonstrated his faithfulness 
in keeping His promises. What the psalmist loved to praise about the Lord, His steadfast love, His constancy. Uh, Coming from a reservoir of infinite power, God's goodness. That's the Christian's hope. And it is a real hope, and it is a hope that has an impact on how we respond to the real world and the lives that we live and the situations that we face. It's life in a fallen world. It's life in a hostile world. It's a hard world. And yet in this world, in this life, even in this, we can have hope. Amen. When, we, when we fetter ourselves to the finite, This verse will not be true. This rejoicing, this persevering, this hanging in, it won't be true. We are to love, we are to emulate, we are to defer, to serve, to hope, and then sixthly, we are to pray. Paul says very simply, be constant in prayer. How do you do this? You're not doing it right now because you're listening and you're not praying. What's going on here? Uh, Let's look to Luther for some help. He wrote a commentary on Romans 2. Uh, Luther said there's uh, two kinds of prayers. There's there's the vocal and the mental. And of course, of course, of course, he's going to take a lot of swipes at medieval, latter medieval Roman Catholicism with being way off on the vocal prayers part of things. Such colorful commentary on Romans Luther wrote for us. He'll name names. He'll think back not so fondly on his monastic days. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about the mindless repetition. He's talking about vocal prayers that come from a regenerate heart, that that claim the promises of God, that confess sin, that ask for supplication, that praise His name. We know that that's prayer, vocal prayers. But we often think of prayer as that, whether they're vocalized or not vocalized. Words that we construct together and say to God, either in our minds or out loud, That's what we think of prayer. And Luther calls that vocal prayer. But then Luther says there's also mental prayer, which is a mind, starts with the mind. He's thinking back on 12, 1, as he's talking about this. Starts with the mind, and then then it's the heart, what he calls a spiritual disposition. So there are the vocal prayers, and there is the prayer life. And uh, Luther came out of the monastery where the whole day was marked by the hours. The whole day was marked by the prayers. The, the, as the sun moved across the sky, you had your prayers to mark it. But he's talking about the soul's communion with God when he says, Paul says, be constant in prayer. An attunement of our mind and heart with God. And you know, you know this. Prayer changes us. Doesn't change God. He is immutable. You don't need to change Him. You can't change Him. We are the ones who need to get into that attunement. We are the ones that need to change. And this disposition, this mental, spiritual disposition of being constant in prayer aligns us with God. 
I uh, almost think this hymn should be requisite for every single worship service, Come Thou Fount, because of the singular line in there, tune our hearts, tune my heart to sing your praise, because our, our hearts are slightly out of tune, and sometimes more out of tune than others. And here's that music teacher again. I didn't know that was even possible that you could play like that. So we need, we need to be aligned and attuned. And so don't think, don't think this is hyperbole. Be constant in prayer. Oh, don't think Paul doesn't actually mean that. He does. He does. And as always, Luther helps us see how. Well, this list, these six things, uh, this is what the transformed life looks like. This life of love, this life of service, this life of humility, this life of prayer. This is what the transformed life looks like. But at verse 13, I think we see a very practical outworking of this. And so I want to see verse 13 as sort of the application of this. Now, it's two more ethical commands, and I understand that. But I also think it's a little bit of the application. Again, back to Murray. He makes a very interesting point about the first century world, and he simply says this. The world was inhospitable. Therefore, hospitality. The world that the Christians lived in was an inhospitable world. Therefore, the exhortation to hospitality. But I think we can think about hospitality broadly. Now, you know the gold standard in the hospitality industry is, is the Ritz-Carlton. And they have these training sessions, and they train others how to do hospitality, and they have a very simple motto. It's governed that, uh, industry, that business since its inception. Ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. I've, I've borrowed that uh, for RBC, so I like to, to tell the staff and faculty that at RBC, we are theologians serving theologians. That's what we do. We're all that. But what if we thought about hospitality that way? We are servants serving servants. We are redeemed sinners serving redeemed sinners. We are strangers, aliens, and exiles serving aliens, strangers, and exiles. Uh, yes, it has to do with opening one's home, and it has to do with meals, and, and in the first century, uh, and in ours, uh, has to do with even providing lodging. But, but what, if, what if we think of hospitality as a far broader? Of, we live in an inhospitable world. How, how may I serve you? Oh, we live in a hostile world. How may I meet your need? And, and see what uh, Paul tells us here. We have to seek to show it. Not just wait for somebody to knock at the door and say, hey, I really need help with this. But seeking it out, eyes wide open, ears wide open, listening, looking for where someone could be helped. And in the process, we're living out love. We're living out service. We're, we're demonstrating deference. If we were serving servants, serving servants. I think more than ever, especially in the American church context, more than ever, we need this. 
the world seems sl- slightly more inhospitable than I think it used to be. Uh, the world seems slightly more hostile and openly hostile than it used to be. And so we really need each other. And we really need each other in person, together, showing hospitality to one another. Well, there it is, 13 things, six things. Seems a little overwhelming, doesn't it? Seems a little daunting. They all flow back to one thing. It was the grace of God that brought us into this family. And it's the grace of God that keeps us. We don't have to white knuckle through these things. We have an example of our Savior. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have the abundant, infinite grace of God. And so, we can live the transformed life and show these marks of a Christian. Our Father and our God, how You have loved us. How Your Son has set the example for us for how we should live, for that greatest, highest good that we should pursue. How clear is Your Word to us. May all these virtues, all these practices mark our lives, mark our churches, be at work in us, transforming us, renewing us, so that we might live this life in Your service by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.